Uh, my name is Derek Laufenberg. I'm the technical director for the Mid Wow, that's loud. Uh, Midwest, and I work with a lot of the MarkLogic customers and prospects on how to use MarkLogic and the operational data hub pattern. Specifically, uh, my team has been doing a lot of work in this area with insurance companies, uh, Erie, but also others. And you think about the insurance industry. Insurance is really an important uh, business. It helps protect our homes, our lives, our, our families, our property. It's serious. It's highly regulated and highly competitive. It's a difficult industry to work in. My team, we get to go in and work with different companies. And one of the things we typically do is map out how data flows through the organization. And it's really not just insurance. It's, it's all the companies we work with. It's all about mapping the data and how it flows through the organization. And we see ETL processes and data marts and data warehouses and lots of data movement, lots of friction, lots of, lots of movement. With insurance, um, you know, if I were to build one of these systems in the real world, it would look a little bit like this. Things move around. They're a lot of fun to build, these Rube Goldberg machines. I think back when I was in fifth grade, lots of fun to build. But we're building them in the IT industry. That's a lot of work and a lot of complexity. There's got to be a different way. When I think about insurance, they've got this problem even worse. Not just through mergers and acquisitions, which is common in that industry, but also in the businesses that they support. If my uh, homeowners looks like this, my automotive infrastructure might look like this at a small company. My small commercial might look like, like this. I love this last slide, the shadow of the Rube Goldberg machine reminds me of the shadow IT that we see when we map this, this sort of process and data flow out within our organization. This is pretty typical. It's not just insurance. We see this everywhere. Um, by, by show of hands, who here is from the insurance industry? Great. What about financial services, more broadly? A few of those. Does this resonate? Are these the sorts of uh, machinery that you have behind the scenes? We won't let your customers know. It's all right. <laughs> It's not just insurance and financial services, though. When you look at the industry as a whole, we're spending more and more money just to keep the lights on. We're being asked to secure the data, do a better job managing, protecting it, uh, keeping people from encrypting it and asking for bitcoins. And of course, the cost. Just moving that data around, the ETL alone is consuming 60% of some very high wage, highly brilliant people spending time just shuffling data around. There's got to be a better way. Brian, Brian Novacek has been with uh, Erie for many years. He's a 20-year veteran of the IT industry. And for the last two plus years, he's been working with MarkLogic and Erie and leading the charge there to build a much more efficient, better way of managing data within the Erie organization. He's here today to share with you some of his experiences and how and lessons learned implementing a data hub or operational data hub pattern. So without further ado, Brian. Thank you. Over. So I wanted to um, share with everyone a little bit about Erie Insurance first. Um, we're located in, in Erie, Pennsylvania is our headquarters. We have over 5,000 employees and 12,000 agents. Uh, we're the 10th largest homeowner uh, insurer, 12th largest auto and 15th for um, property and casualty. Um, so what do we do every day? What drives us? It's to provide as near perfect protection and service as humanly possible at, a, at the lowest possible cost. So we're a 90-year-old company. Uh, we have many of the same challenges all of you do. We have data silos. We have shadow IT. We have complex integration and workflows. And we have challenges with um, our data. We have the same concerns around our mainframe as you guys do. Um, and ultimately, we want a better view of our customer, a 360 degree view. Our needs, several years ago, we had a project that came along that really got the idea going as to how would we handle um, a need for higher speed data in a central source. And it really launched us down this journey of trying to find an easier way to do data processing, how we do what we do today, but does it have to be so hard? Can't be simpler. So as we were going along and trying to find what would provide us that um, 
that better place, we, we, we had a few um, needs. We wanted to improve our application delivery time. We wanted things to be in hours and weeks, not weeks and months. We wanted to be more flexible, more agile in our processes. Um, and probably most importantly, the one simple goal is to turn data into information as fast as possible. When a customer calls in and gives us that new piece of information, we need to be able to turn it around and deliver it to someone who can take action on it quickly. Uh, so we started to research a number of platforms and options from relational in-memory options to different types of systems that can or, and can and cannot persist data. Uh, looked at FDE and SME uh, requirements. And we finally came down to we needed something. Uh, the NoSQL options became more favorable, specifically the document-based ones. We needed something that was flexible. We needed something that could easily scale compared to your traditional relational systems today. We needed something that came standard with security, able to handle transactions being ACID compliant. And we wanted something that would fit into our operational model today, right? That a true core system could be supported. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Derek. And he's going to take us through a little bit of the data hub pattern with Mark Logic. Great. Thanks, Brian. So who here attended Damon's uh, data hub session this morning at 11? I apologize in advance. Damon did it in much more detail than I'm going to cover. But if you think about the problem in those machines that I, I drew on at the beginning, there's a lot of data sources. This is maybe the more adult version of that slide, the data sources that you have in the insurance industry, what you need to pull together. Keep in mind, that is going to vary by the line of business. That's a lot of work to land that information and move it around the organization. We need a way of being much more flexible with that information, pulling it into a single place, securing it. How many people are familiar with GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation over in Europe? Yeah, uh, the clock is ticking. You have one year and 10 days uh, before that takes effect. In order to secure information according to that type of regulation, you can't have it scattered across your, your organization. So we need a different way of thinking about the problem, different way of managing the information. Um, we need to do, be able to do things much faster and in real time. That's what led to the operational data hub pattern. Now this isn't something brand new. It's actually been evolving. MarkLogic and our consultants and partners and customers, we've been evolving this pattern for a number of years now. Uh, we're kind of joking here with definition version 1.2, but really it is kind of evolving. When you look at the, the critical features of it, it's a centralized location, real time, operational. I can work with my data as I need it. I can service many consumers of that information. I can put the information in, get it out, and be able to not only service my analytics, but also be able to do other types of discovery on it. This is a very robust and rich set of uh, goals that we're, we're aiming to solve. From an uh, architectural point of view, it's, it's, it's another bow tie. But let's, let's look at inside this bow tie a little bit. Data sources on the left. Being able to deal with any type of data source, relational, structured, unstructured, and land, yeah, point off, sorry about that, um, land any type of content. Message buses means I'm dealing with operational activity in real time, gathering the information across the system. We talk about loading and landing as is. Now the important thing about as is, is it starts to lay the foundation for traceability. I can track back what you gave me when I want to operationalize your data and I find something wrong, I can follow it through the system and show what I got and better yet, I can annotate what I got, land it. That's what we start doing with the harmonization step. We take all that information as is and actually shape it into good usable entities. Apply code, apply formatting, uh, decide what data we actually need. Think about the problem you have if you're to do this relationally. And Brian, you jump in here any time on this one. Uh, you have to have that model up front. You, you make a lot of decisions about what to leave on the floor. With this pattern, you bring it along. You don't have to throw it away. You can keep it. You may not use it right away. 
That's the as needed part of that harmonization step. And finally, deliver the context, deliver the information to different types of consumers and applications. Applications which are going to operate on that data, put results back into the hub. Applications are going to draw data off the hub in a proper format for further analytics. Whatever the consumption format is needed, the hub can deliver that very easily and keep it traceable with all the metadata and data in one place. Absolutely. And the um, ability to go back as you're bringing information over um, is very easy to change. Let's say from your relational system, number 50 elements, you only want to expose 10. You can just bring those over, harmonize the 10 you need, and as you see in that envelope pattern, right, you can, in that colored area, you save all 50 as is, but I'm only exposing those other 10. If I decide months later to go back and expose 10 more, I just run an updated maintenance process and expose them. It's very simple. It's relatively quick. You don't have to pull them back in again? No. They're already there. Nice. So my team gets to do this a lot. They go into different organizations, work with the uh, people who are new to MarkLogic, perhaps a little bit skeptical, and lay out a little bit of the ingestion, pull the data together, and start discovering connections within that information, or turning that data into information. The typical pattern is one of my engineers will go in, work with another engineer or two at the organization, subject matter experts. They know how to get their data out of the existing system usually. We land that into MarkLogic and start building some search and discovery tools around that using MarkLogic we see a very fast turnaround. In order for me to go in and do that with my, my team, I can't spend months and months. This is stuff that has to happen in days and weeks. And we do this all the time. That's the cool thing about my job. We get to do this all the time. This is common stuff. And we see very, you know, uh, a couple of dedicated guys in 300 hours gets a very slick application. By very conservative metrics, we're seeing a four to one or better improvement in general application delivery. And where I think the power really comes into it, and we've touched on it with the hub pattern, when things change. You know, mid-course corrections, requirements shifting on you. Uh, who here has ever done a project and gotten everything right up front? Yeah, that's what I expected. Nobody does that. It's too hard. You don't know what you don't know at that point. This is where MarkLogic and the data hub pattern really can help save you. Because as you adapt to change, all right, enough me. Let Brian tell you how you adapt to change. So we ran through a very similar POC. Um, we had a number of POCs before we actually acquired MarkLogic. Um, the, this particular one was very similar. We had a, uh, we were asked to take something that we could measure in apples to apples comparison. So we took a, a piece of production development that was going on that was in critical path. We took the requirements, the story cards, and the same data, put it down in on production, and we took a junior developer who had never been uh, exposed to MarkLogic, a second engineer, and an intern, and we gave them a week's notice to prep up on what MarkLogic was. Wait, a junior development, an intern? An intern, yes. Stack in the deck. Yeah. Okay, just check it. So we gave them the exact same requirement, the exact same story cards and we, we set them loose. So they had a week to read, watch YouTube videos about MarkLogic, go to MarkLogic University. Uh, that following Monday, the pre-sales uh, engineer from MarkLogic showed up, spent two days with them, getting them familiar with the um, system, if you will. After that, uh, he went away, provided remote support via phone and email. And those two gentlemen basically were left with producing the same set of uh, requirements and deliverables as the core team was doing. Uh, they ended up finishing um, quicker, and it, it was very similar to what we saw in the previous slide. They were about four times quicker than what our critical path team was doing of experienced um, staff. These, these were the results as we measured each of the steps as we went through. The upfront data modeling was the modeling and mapping exercise that our analysts do up front, they spend a lot less time. And keep in mind, this is all the people involved with this, the, um, the team of two were really on the build side, the data model here. This was um, our normal analysts doing that work for them. So they spent significantly less time than they did with relational. And this was with them doing a document type modeling exercise for the first time. 
uh, loading the data was um, much faster. Query construction was about the same. Alerts and notification was obviously faster. The, the big one that has really, how's this little fat work? Whoop. So I won't use the laser. So the model, res so the model change response, that has really paid big dividends. When we were giving the demo to our leadership, the, um, the developer who had done the work, he's sitting there typing, trying to get his demo to go. And what, one of the um, uh, executives asked him, so, how, so did you get any model changes? Anything change on you in midstream? He's like, oh yeah, he's typing away. And he goes, well, how long did it take for you to you know, implement the changes? Like, ah, 10, 15 minutes. And he just keeps typing, right? He's just totally ignoring it. Well, in our normal world, it takes you know, days and weeks. And he's sitting there just blowing it off. He knows no big deal. And that's really what we've seen consistently. Also, as we've implemented now with multiple um, projects in production, we have been able to use that agility to allow us to change sequence without really much harm. And we, we get a, a lot more reuse and not a lot of rebuild. The API and, and UI development during the POC was about equivalent, but we've seen our API development over time now has become much more streamlined outside of the POC. Why, why did we choose MarkLogic? Um, it, it's enterprise grade. We, we sell and service insurance, right? We're not here to write backup modules or develop security. Uh, like with some of the competitive products out there. We want something built in with asset transactions that can do a backup and recovery that is already available for high availability, disaster recovery, and has a very comprehensive security model. The flexible data model, as I said before, has been paying off in huge dividends. It allows us to chop up the work more. If we're getting through a project, someone's missed a requirement, but it's not core, we leave it because, again, we're working in days and weeks, not weeks and months. If it is critical, it has to go in, it's no big deal. It, 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 it'll, it'll take the team a couple hours, usually, to um, correct it. The fast search was part of the POC we did early on. It might have been one of the first ones that, that we did with the um, sales team. Uh, they came on site real quick. Uh, it was three days. Came on site, installed the product, loaded the data, and attached a developmental UI that we had developed. And in that UI was a search engine that we had developed in-house. We had spent hundreds of hours, I mean, a ton of time. Um, within those three days, when we were doing the demo, we were using the MarkLogic search algorithm instead of ours, consist consistently returning 200 millisecond response time, which was far superior, and quite frankly, a lot less development than what we had done. Um, also, we required something that was scalable and offered real-time alerting. Um, and again, um, our results compared to our traditional methods were about a four to one improvement across the board. One of the other things you have to think about is, so you, you know, like the solar system, right? You have the sun in the middle. Imagine the hub, the data hub's in the middle. Then you have processes that stem out from it. You have to look at all of that. If you want the maximum amount of return for efficiency and acceleration, you need to look beyond what you're technically doing inside the hub. You also need to look at the processes that surround it. So to start with technology, um, quite frankly, the product works. We haven't had any issues with it. And it, uh, we had a project initially to operationalize it. That went through. Um, really no issues there. Um, that, that's been the simple part, which it should be. That's, that's what we paid for. The process change, they, this is the first fun one. Um, you have to be willing to go back and look at all your processes, not just within IT, but all of them. If you have a process that says um, you're delivering a project in six or eight weeks, you don't want to sit around for a two-week review. I, 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 I want that change. I want it faster. Um, ETL, extract, transform, load becomes extract, load, transform. That's very true. That has really helped in terms of ETL flexibility, design, execution. I don't need these high-level uh, ETL experts from your favorite product set. We're, we're ingesting XML documents. We simply extract them from the core system. We have a model and a map, and, and we load it into the hub using the harmonization. It, it's, it's a much more efficient process, and it takes a lower skill set to accomplish it. The uh, data model, you know, I think we've touched upon that a couple times, but it is. It'll, the flexibility is huge. The fact that we can go in and correct a mistake or a miss, however you want to view it, do it easily and quickly, 
And the other one is the Big Bang. You don't have to do everything up front. And that's been a big cultural change. You don't have to be 100% correct and get into analysis paralysis, right? It's okay to go forward with 90% because you can catch up on it. And that's a big shift mentally for, for our teams to adapt to. Um, the big one, communicate. Communicate a lot. It's very important that everyone understands what we're, what you're doing, how you're going to go about doing it, because you will experience a lot of questions. Um, if you listen to the ad car mantra for change, you have to communicate or tell someone seven to eight times before they start to accept it. Not that they're not listening, they're just not receiving. <laughs> <laughs> people change. You're going to spend a lot of time on people change if you're going to accept the acceleration, the efficiency <coughs> opportunities that the data hub and mark logic technology provide. It's very disruptive in a good way. We learned after our first project, we had a lot of questions continuously through from the team. What about this? Why are you doing this? This isn't what I expected, right? Everyone had their own ideas in their head. Some people were just relating back to what they would do traditionally. Some people had their head on their own and were just, they, they just had their own ideas. So we actually developed a PowerPoint that we take to every project kickoff with the teams. And we walk them through it from all the um, technicians through management if they wish to attend. We walk them through basically what's going to happen, who does what, and at a high level what happens. And that has really helped with all of the in-between communications that had been going on. It seems to make the teams a lot more um, accepting and calmer. And they also have something to go back and reflect upon, right? For those seven or eight times they, that they have to hear or see something. Expanding with the right project. So we, based on our investment, have, uh, we do have MarkLogic Services in-house helping us from day one. That's because I wanted to see immediate return on our investment. But we've also paired our internal employees with them. So they're shadowing and building up their skills as, as the MarkLogic guys are executing or learning at the same time. So from a skill set, I'm confident our MarkLogic team can handle anything we can throw at them. But for the new team members, we want to make sure we're giving them tasks that they can't accomplish with a little bit of challenge to it. The other thing is to keep focused. We're building a data hub. MarkLogic is capable in our, our environment of many other things. We're not focused on those. Um, data hub projects, the, the people, the investment around that, they have deliverables, they have projects. That's what they do day in and day out. Everything else, we've been leveraging our pre-sales team to help us with. They actually come on site every so often, they hold office hours, and they handle all those what if, I don't understand, could this be a POC, how would it work? We, we, we've offloaded that work over to those guys, and it's been very beneficial. I made them put that part in there, just for the record, so <laughs> thank you. <laughs> There's drinks later. Um, our end goal, like I said, we have, services in, we have services on site helping us, training our staff. Our goal is to become self-sufficient. You guys are probably familiar with a, a lot of um, vendors look to move in, and we're not looking for that experience here, and, and MarkLogic has not tried to do that. So we're trying to become very self-sufficient. We have built a center of excellence. Uh, the most important thing I can share with you around that is to pick people who are open-minded and want to take on this challenge. Uh, you want people who are willing to do things differently, try things, and be open-minded. You don't want someone who is um, Highly skilled at something, but not but not looking for a change. Um, like I said, we are leveraging the MarkLogic Consulting Services to um, to help us. And the other thing is, we have been sending our folks to the MarkLogic University for the online training and resources, and that has proved to be extremely valuable. So today, we are building a data hub using MarkLogic as as the core technology. Uh, we're doing it the Mark Logic way. We're not going in and second guessing it. We're not trying to customize it because we know better. Um, we don't, and we're, we're following a path that's already been defined. And the big one is focusing on the processes. Again, going back to that solar system model, it's very, very important to look holistically at your data processing, what you're doing. It's you're going to affect your modeling, your requirement gathering for projects, how you frame your deliverables. You have to look at the entire infrastructure in, in terms of the project. Don't just limit it to the technical in, um, 
the technical, and I can't talk today. The, 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 the technical install itself, because you, you're going to leave it on the table. Ex acceleration while learning for us that has been tremendous. Not only is the staff being trained, but we're also seeing immediate return. Again, we're doing projects in days and weeks, not months and years. And delivering faster. That, that only happens when you've changed all your processes. And again, it goes back to being iterative. It's not about changing all the processes right now to where they're perfect for tomorrow. It's getting into that mindset to constantly be reviewing the process. It took five hours this time. That's better than 10. Can I get down to two? Is that doable? Maybe not now. Maybe a year from now you revisit again, right? It's having that mindset to where you're constantly looking at your processes and saying, how, what can I shave? What can I do differently? So, we've got a little bit of time here. Uh, I'd like to open it up for, for questions. We've got this very cool plush microphone. We're told that we're allowed to throw it, so we're really looking for some of Yeah, so. Yeah, a um, couple of questions. Uh, how much data you process in real time, and how big your cluster? So for the data we process in real time, so we've been in production for about 18 months. Um, we are still, like I said, we're in, we have a mainframe, so we're still batched to a large degree. Uh, we are moving to more real time. So we quite haven't gotten to that real time point yet. It, it, it's a dependency, not that the technology can't handle it, but our other systems, it, it takes a lot more to change those. So we're not at that point yet, but, but we look to be headed in that direction. What's the cycle there? Rhythm, nightly batch, or so it's a nightly batch? Yeah. Yes. Oh, we get the throw. <laughs> All right. Uh, quick question, because I know we got a mix of business and technical people in the audience. Back to the people and the change management. What was the hardest thing, both from the business and the technical side? So that was the change component for them, um, in terms of going from the old way to your new new way with MarkLogic? So it was a couple things. You know, doing the POC showed incredible acceleration. You have to be careful when you show that to people because it's not real world. There's a lot of process not around that. But it got them very, very, very excited. We had to have a number of conversations to where if we're going to do this, we talked about all those other uh, processes, right, in your solar system. We had to get them to agree we're going to do things differently. And we're going down this journey together as IT and the business to, as we encounter these things, we're making iterative changes. We're slowly improving and getting better. Um, that was really the, the largest thing, is getting to that understanding. I think as we go through it more and more, we get into that groove and people see the benefits. Because the benefit of the quick iterations is that people see a tangible result where the right satisfaction comes back. So they, they, they see what happens, right? You make a sandwich, you can do it immediately. You don't have to grow a tomato and wait for the tomato before you have a BLT, right? And that, that's the type of change here. They do something they see immediately. And also, the process benefits everywhere are immediate because you might not understand what happens when you speed things up. <laughs> two, two quick questions. Um, one, what are you finding is your normal learning curve for people coming up and being proficient in MarkLogic? So we have two tracks. We have, um, we have a gentleman in our, in our database administration section who has been um, uh, dropped into this head first, and he's done a very good job of picking this up. Um, again, I think, it, it, I think it, it depends on the individual, right? If you have a person with that right mindset, it's been great. The gentleman who did the POC, that developer, he's a smart guy. I mean, he picked it up. The POC almost failed because the UI he was building was a .NET. That's not compatible. You have to build a serializer to allow the dynamic query to go on. Well, that's not available. So the, he had to go build one. That took the majority of the time. And it was his persistence. He was successful, got it done and the POC worked. 
So it really depends on the, the people you pick for that. So I would say for him, he picked it up really, really fast. Okay. Um, my other question was just, did you hire the intern from the POC? <laughs> that was not the intern. I honestly can't remember what the intern did. I, I know he participated. Uh, I think he built the, um, uh, the templates for, for the UI. But it, it, uh, the two gentlemen who worked on it, the developer and the engineer, were, were, were full-time employees. They just weren't senior well at the time. Oh, I'm not get that good of a throw. <laughs> I'll wipe right. out a few people. I was going to ask, what was it different about the data modeling that made it so much shorter to do? So part of it is, it's a fun question. <laughs> it, it becomes simpler. It's not as complex. We're not requiring a complete mapping back to our bomb. Um, we're also not having those crazy discussions around I'm going from one relational schema to this new relational schema and all the implications. It becomes a little bit easier because we have all these unique domains within the hub. So I can have a freestanding claims document versus a policy document versus a customer document. And, and, and what's neat about that, as I said before, and maybe it, it, the skill set that we needed before was much higher. I needed a real high end modeler, someone who really understood everything. I needed a real high end ETL person. Um, that has changed for us. We're able to take folks who are interested in it and skill them up. And then nowadays, we're looking for a very competent four or five level. And they can technically do the work. It, it's really understanding the data that's key for us now. Did you start with a lot of XML data? Or what was the landscape of some of the sources? We started with XML because our ESB talks in XML. Okay. So it, it was a transformation that was already occurring. It was easy for us. And it matched with our third party partners. Yeah, it's a common pattern I see a lot. They'll take the XML and put it in a blob and pick out two or three elements and index on it and then realize, oh, we need another index, so we'll scan all the blobs and extract again. Um, that takes weeks to months. And then they'll repeat that cycle three or four times to, before they have all the data in a format that they needed. And I look at that as, it's XML. You're done. So we, we, we actually did that. One of our initial projects was to show, uh, to prove that documents work, was we use a, we have a mainframe with DB2, with DB2 XML, and we loaded XML documents into there. That's pretty much what we did, and the use case is really simple. I'm always calling back on the same key. I needed to keep the, uh, the XML together, so it didn't make sense to shred it. And it was very efficient, but later on, they had too much success, because then users came back and wanted to report off it. Well, it became a real pain in, in the backside to report off of in order to make it work. When I have this in-house as well, this is a lot simpler and easier. Yes. Talk to the boss. <laughs> so uh, what are the uh, business use cases you are solving uh, using uh, operational data hub that you are building for the past 18 months? If you can name a few use cases. So we're using our hub to do several things. It is going to be satisfying real-time lookup and queries of our portal systems, um, of um, customers and agents out in the field on their devices, and also for um, typical BI reporting and for our analytics. So just one or two critical things. A handful. Yeah. <laughs> More questions? You get to talk to the box. I'm going to, oh, it's so tempting. Yeah, we got suds in the way there. <laughs> um, how do you overcome your, uh, your regular IT resistance? I mean, how do you basically get on this track? <laughs> so within IT, I wouldn't say there was resistance within IT per se. It was really more of, so you bring in a new type of database. So you had the typical conversations with the gentleman who supports our, in, our, our current in-house systems. You know, why not me, why not this one, why not that one? Once we started showing results in POCs as to how quickly we could do things, how quickly we could avoid costs, like around that search example, 
the IT people, the, 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 and with, especially within operations, the hardcore technicians quickly realized the advantages and also was not a threat, right? I'm not taking Mark Logic and replacing the database in your people soft or something like that. We're using it for a hub. Totally net new, totally different. So it also didn't have that, um, you weren't taking away work from someone per se. So we, we sort of sidestepped that issue. But I'm, I'm, I'm kind of curious how you, how you got to that point because you, you're talking now that you got IT convinced how do you get to the point that you actually, I mean, what I'm dealing with is that it's hard to get a POC organized because IT is resisting. It is. So in our organization, we are highly, um, we're decentralized. Okay. So each line of business has their own IT organization, if you will, to a degree. Within the data realm, they are used to doing as they see fit within their silo. Okay. So the people change is not so much the operations people supporting Mark Logic. It's my developers on that big team making data decisions, taking that away, putting it into a COE, and saying, you're going to give me data in a mapping document according to these specifications, period. You say it nicely, but <laughs> basically it's going to happen this way. And we will take it, process it, give you a data set, and then you can query against it. That is a touchy subject because now I am taking away work from people that they are very proud of doing, and you're and you're trying to do it quickly, right? You have a project spinning up. So it's showing people that this is beneficial for everyone and it's not threatening. That it is, it, it's a challenge. It requires a lot of conversation. It also requires our management from the top down has been extremely supportive. So it's, it's more than just a database change. It, it's really a cultural thing. Thank you. So going back to the, <coughs> the, this first slide where you said uh, bringing the data as is. Mm -hmm. So when you said from your transactional system you brought as is means the relational relation between all the tables was strictly enforced or did you have to redefine them or how did you like so go about doing it? When, when, when we say bring the data over as is, that's a good question. Because we have some people who believe it's as is, you just throw it in the system, right? And it's like your kid's bedroom, right? It's just a mess. Yeah. Toy <laughs> toy, right? So we do want the data as is because it's new. I know people over here, as they consume the data, are going to question, was that 5 or 50 that came over? I want you to show me what really came over. So we define how they deliver us a document. It's an XML form. We, we, we have it named. We have it mapped. And as we ingest it in that purple area, I keep that document forever. Well, not forever, but I ingest it as is. I retain that. Then we do a, a partial transformation or harmonization where I take whatever they've required. So when I extract from the system, I take everything, 100%. Even though they might only need 20% today, I expose that 20%. But of that 20%, let's say there's a, a standardization occurs. Um, I will show that new value in there. And, but I will have that old original value up above. So if down the line someone else in shadow IT was doing some crazy computation that no one's aware of, I go back and show them this is the value that came from the core system. Okay. But did you have to redefine the relations between different sets of the data? No. No. So when we extract from the core system, we already know the relationship in there. All right. That kind of goes to putting together a good entity document. You know, some of those relationships that exist relationally where you denorm or normalize things yeah. highly, you do want to denormalize it, make a good model, and put everything into the context of a document. So if you have numbers that represent, you know, enumerations, put the enumerated string in there. It's much more meaningful, much more human readable. Those are the types of harmonization steps you would, you would build into the process to make it more usable. And, and readable down term. Um, so we've talked a lot. You, you heard David this morning talk about security. Um, I know you've been thinking about Mark Logic 9. How do you see the, the element level security affecting some of the things that you're doing now? So for some of the systems that we're going to be migrating, that's going to be very um, critical to be able to take social security number, bank account numbers, and um, lock them down. 
Um, I think it'll help a lot with our auditors as they come through because we can prove distinctly based on who you are. You, you're only allowed to see what you're allowed to see. It's, it's very clear. It's, it's very precise. Actually, the big thing I'm liking is the redaction. That's going to help us currently and also for projects that are not HUB related. That'll be huge. What about testing? You know, being able to work with you know, live data but not well, the accurate? the redaction will help yeah. greatly with the um, testing because then I can have people going in and seeing, you know, working with the live data as it's mapped out but they're not seeing things right. they, they don't need to see. It'll also help with the applications themselves. If um, someone's looking something up, right, I don't want to show whatever account number, uh, medical information or whatever. You know, we, we can hide that and show that there's a value. It'll, it'll be very beneficial. Got a couple more minutes. Any other questions out there? Where's the mic? Way in the back. You want to start tossing that back and <laughs> come on, Eric, go for it. <laughs> okay. Um, so I, I I saw on the slide that, that you mentioned you know, one of the, the important things is focusing on the uh, the use case at hand. Um, and I I missed the first few minutes, so I apologize. But uh, have you looked at um, other use cases where where you might be looking at sort of um, security in, from uh, uh, like like almost cybersecurity or fraud management or a number of those kinds of use cases for this kind of system. So at a high level, yes, we have. In terms of the broader population, no. So we've made an investment to to build a hub, and what we're going to do for us is it's not a small task. And then you wrap around the culture change that's, that's occurring between the processes and how people are learning to work differently. That's a lot. And we are trying to remain very focused on all of those things without introducing all the other things that you can do with the technology. I think once we develop a rapport and we have a repeatable pattern and it becomes more ingrained, then it would be appropriate to start looking at those secondary use cases outside of the hub. It's just a matter of being able to control the work going through and do it to a high quality. Want to throw that back up? <laughs> or <laughs> Where are you going? Back to front every time there. <laughs> um, so in your data management landscape, uh, because you, you now your company is running for several years, you must be having a traditional way of doing data warehousing, data marts, and probably you might have data lake. How does this coexist with, with the existing landscape, legacy landscape uh, of the data management? So in terms of the legacy, so the hub is replacing all those marts, ODSs, warehouses, all of that. Um, It's really, we, we have other, the data hub is, is one leg of, of a string. So, but to answer your question very directly, the hub, if it works well, is going to be the central place to, re, to retrieve all data. It will be the single source of record outside of the core system. So once you make a change to a billing statement, it's gonna come down in near real time to the hub and everyone else who needs to see it that doesn't have access to that billing system will be coming through the hub to see it, if, if they're allowed to see it, of course. One source of truth, one source for security, yep. one database to rule them all. No, wait, sorry. Other questions? Well, we're about out of time, and it appears to be we're out of questions. Thank you, everyone, for, for coming. Brian, thank you for the talk. Appreciate it. Great job.